Thank you. Uh, thank you, Angela. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Patrick Arbor, and I'm very pleased to be here today. I've been um, talking in your state since uh, Monday morning. I started off in Baker City, and then yesterday I was at the Dales. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Uh, and then today here, and then I go on to Roseburg, and then Albany. Uh, so it's just really nice not only getting to meet people here, uh, but also the spectacular terrain, and it's just been quite, really stunning. I was saying that this morning when I talked to my family, it was 53 degrees in San Francisco, which is where I'm from, and they're expecting a high of 65. <laughs> and uh, this heat is a little different for me, so. Uh, but I'm happy to be here, and I might have met some of you uh, when I've been to Corvallis for the Mental Health and Aging Conference there, and uh, over the years, I've given talks in Portland and different places, but I've never been uh, to these parts, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm the director and founder of the Center for Elderly Suicide Prevention and Grief-Related Services. Uh, we're now a program of Institute on Aging, but we began in 1973 and uh, with uh, a service called the Friendship Line for the Elderly. And um, this service began as a result of what was then called the San Francisco Commission on the Aging. And uh, they were really concerned about the high rates of suicide among older people uh, in the Bay Area. And they were <coughs> concerned about the, um, that it didn't seem to have commensurate numbers of older people calling traditional suicide prevention centers. So they were, very wondering about that and wanted to know whether we could come up with a, another approach that might attract older people that might be depressed or uh, lonely, isolated, uh, bereaved, um, and uh, depressed, possibly suicidal, and uh, what could we do? And, and I was part of the team that was um, asked to think about this, and uh, if we didn't need a branding organization and months of you know, doing talks and community involvement to figure out that uh, what I knew in terms of aging was that older people are much more comfortable uh, having a conversation rather than a confrontation. And so when we would answer the phone, hello, suicide prevention, uh, we knew or guessed that a lot of times when there were an immediate hang up, it was probably somebody that might have been a little older and who was uncomfortable with that kind of um, uh, uh, address. But when we answered the phone, hello, friendship line, uh, what we found is that older people were much more likely to uh, communicate. And uh, so that's how the friendship line uh, came into existence. So uh, we've been, um, operational for 43 years, and uh, not only are we interested in older people, particularly people 75 plus, but we also um, uh, really encourage family caregivers uh, to utilize the friendship line uh, because I feel that they are under a lot of stress themselves and uh, you know, don't necessarily get the attention that they deserve um, for doing such difficult work, particularly with people that have uh, features of dementia or other kinds of, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, grave health concerns, and uh, so I'm very proud of the fact that Friendship Line uh, continues to this day, and uh, that 800 number uh, is one that certainly you can use too uh, for, you know, any of your consumers or clients or or, or uh, caregivers. Uh, because they, we do get calls from the state of Oregon. We get calls from uh, across the country as well. Back in 1973, if we had 50 um, calls or contacts with older people, you know, I thought that was really pretty good. And uh, in the month of June, uh, we had 8,000 contacts um, from um, you know, older people as well as younger disabled. We will speak to people who are younger disabled uh, because that, particularly people in that you know, 50 to 59 age range often feel like they are too old for a lot of programs and not old enough for others. And so we're very happy to um, uh, talk with them as well. And uh, we're an accredited crisis intervention center accredited by the American Association of Suicidology. 
and, uh, and they're based in Washington, D.C. And just as with any accreditations that you might have to go through with your programs, you know, it's quite an arduous uh, undertaking. And um, the AAS is very interested in how we train our volunteers and staff and, um, you know, just how we work with our older callers or younger callers. And uh, so we're very pleased uh, to have their uh, blessing in terms of accreditation. And what they were very um, happy about is that our line is not just a crisis intervention line, uh, we're also a warm line as well. And we're the only accredited crisis intervention hotline warm line for older adults throughout the country. Uh, so we're very uh, pleased that we can provide this type of service and uh, provide for older people particularly just another option for them. Uh, and again, people, if they don't want to give their name, it's certainly fine. They can be anonymous. What we do like to know is uh, what county they're from or what state they're from is um, useful for us. Um, so we're happy to collaborate with people in the state of Oregon. We're very interested in um, older people from rural counties, whether that's in California or Nevada or Oregon or Idaho uh, and other places throughout the country. And so uh, for me, it's particularly really important to uh, be here uh, with you uh, because my roots are in rural America. I was born and raised in western Pennsylvania on a dairy farm. And I mean farm, not ranch. Uh, and I think you get it. Um, was not exactly an easy uh, life. Whoops. And, uh, and so anyway, I'm glad to be here to uh, work with you this morning. And as we go along, if you have a question, uh, don't hesitate to uh, ask. I might have to repeat it uh, if, so that people can hear it. Uh, but uh, I, I like uh, doing uh, more of a dialogue rather than a monologue. Uh, so don't hesitate to raise questions uh, as we go along. And uh, <clears throat> the other aspect of our friendship line that we think is very unique and helpful is our call-out service, too. We see this particularly helpful for older men that um, when we look at our numbers, it's usually about 75% to 80% of our incoming calls are from uh, older women. And, uh, you know, around 20% or 25% from uh, older men. But when we call out to people, uh, what we see is much more even. About 50% of the people we call out to are male, 50% are female. And uh, generally, when we call out to people, it's people that, that may have difficulty calling in uh, simply because they might have some uh, memory um, issues or just can't remember the call, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, men, uh, as you probably know, uh, may be reluctant to utilize services, uh, even ones that might increase their well-being, um, because they feel ashamed to ask for help. You know, our value of um, independence and autonomy is, uh, you know, really very, very strong. And uh, so we call out to men, even though they could call in, but they're much more comfortable answering the phone uh, than making a call. So we will do that as well. And uh, so the call out uh, is often something that people find very, um, very attractive. Uh, so, and that's something that that number there is where you would uh, call if you wanted to make a referral and you want us to call out to that person. One of the things that you probably already know, those of you in aging, and I tell my staff and volunteers, uh, if you would make a referral and you say, you know, it's okay to call Mrs. Smith and she lives in the Dales or wherever. See, I'm gonna get very knowledgeable about these towns. Um, I'm quite impressed with myself. And uh, in terms of the geography and Jefferson County, you know, now I know where, because we get calls from people in Jefferson County and I didn't ever know where that was and now I'm, oh, okay. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, when you call and they take the referral, they'll give it to us. And I say to my staff and volunteers, anticipate that when we get Mr. Smith or whoever it is on the phone, uh, that they're going to say, uh, I don't need that. Um, and we anticipate always that we're going to get a no, uh, that maybe the adult son or daughter or a case manager or someone like that is going to say, no, Mr. Smith really needs it. They'll say to you, oh, yeah, they can call. And then we call and they say no, uh, which is very typical. Uh, but what we do is that we will do everything we can uh, 
to get an opportunity to call them back. Uh, and as long as they don't say, absolutely do not call me ever again, uh, we will call them back. Uh, my assistant uh, once had been talking to a gentleman that had been referred to us. His wife had died and, uh, you know, and he was quite isolated and he lived in a rural part of California. And, uh, you know, and she said, we would be happy to call you. And he said, well, I don't think I need it at this time. And she said, well, how about if I call you back in six months, would you be willing to have us call you back? And he said, uh, that would be uh, fine, uh, okay. So when she called back six months later, uh, he picked up the phone and she hadn't said anything yet. And he said, hi, Amy, uh, thanks for calling. And she said, oh my gosh, how would you even know that this was you know, uh, me? And he said, well, when you only get one call every six months, you kind of remember who that was. And uh, so we're very concerned about people that are fiercely lonely. Uh, and uh, loneliness you know, and depression, although loneliness may not cause depression, depression may not cause loneliness, but we know they have a relationship. Uh, and, uh, and so we're very concerned about uh, lonely people and uh, we really try very hard to mm, balance that you know, through uh, having them call us and us calling them. And, uh, and, and one of the things, and you might be familiar with that too, because we won't probably have a lot of time to go into the detail, but uh, Dr. John Cacciapo, for example, in his book, Loneliness, and you might, if you ever have a chance to see his TED talk, uh, I would urge you to do that, uh, Dr. Cacciapo. And uh, what he says about loneliness, and, and other researchers are looking at this too in terms of loneliness, is that what they're seeing is that loneliness can uh, predispose um, you know, someone to a premature death. Uh, and, and Dr. Cacciapo says that you know, uh, loneliness is more of a risk factor for premature death than smoking cigarettes or um, you know, having uh, nutritional problems, that kind of thing. Uh, it's, it's really quite amazing. And, and I know you know this when you're working with uh, uh, older people that are fiercely lonely, is that one would think that people who are lonely would reach out. You might give them referrals or whatever, and you think, oh, they're going to go or uh, to this group or whatever, and they don't go. And uh, one of the interesting things you know, about the science of the brain when it comes to lonely people versus people who are, are not lonely is that instead of lonely people wanting to reach out, uh, they become quite suspicious. Uh, and so they will, they will withdraw. Uh, rather than, you know, and you give them a referral. I say to my volunteers all the time is that, you know, don't quickly give a referral uh, uh, unless that person is really very specific about it, wanting that only. Uh, because you really need to, you know, uh, um, build a, some rapport with people who are very lonely. And that's really the, the genesis for Friendship Line was to really see if we couldn't connect with lonely older people. And the research is pretty uh, uh, consistent about that, that even one person in the life of an older lonely person can make a big difference. And uh, so we can see that when we call out to people and we, every six months we do a, and invite them to participate um, in a in, uh, reassessment where we ask them about loneliness, we ask them about depression, we ask them about suicide risk. And what our data indicate uh, is that, you know, even us calling, you know, three or four times a week to connect with them uh, makes a difference in terms of their loneliness. And so, um, you know, and that's again, uh, something that I really care about. And I'm sure that most of you in this room uh, share that uh, desire uh, to reduce loneliness among older people and or younger disabled individuals. And then my contact information is there. So if you want to, um, or if you have questions or want to email me or whatever, please feel free to do so. And just remind me where you saw me. That just kind of helps me in terms of context. Uh, this is a, a case example and it's a, you know, kind of a, um, a mixture of different people, but um, these are callers from Jefferson County that we've talked to. And so I just kind of pulled different pieces uh, from some of their uh, um, discussions that gives a kind of a, a, a 
typical kind of example. And this is a gentleman uh, who is uh, in his early 60s, and he's divorced and, um, and also unemployed. Uh, he had some uh, health issues, and so uh, unfortunately he was laid off of his uh, job, uh, and he had worked in the lumber industry uh, for decades and uh, just assumed that he was going to continue working there until he decided to retire. And, uh, but he had to leave. And um, he has very few acquaintances, um, uh, not many friends at all. Most of the people that he associated with uh, were uh, you know, work colleagues. And one of the difficulties, as you know, um, you know when you are you know, uh, when you're laid off or you leave your job, uh, you might have, might have some kind of a little gathering where colleagues will sit with you, for example. And then people always say things, and he had said this too, you know, the people said, oh, well, we'll stay in touch and, you know, get together from time to time. Um, but that doesn't happen, you know. Uh, I know people are well-intentioned, but you just get caught up in your life. And so he felt uh, very lonely. And uh, he also has a son, uh, only one uh, child, and the adult son also has some health problems and he lives in a different state. So they don't really have a lot of contact uh, you know, with each other. Uh, but he said, I don't know why I'm living. This is, uh, again, you know, uh, important about suicide and the elderly is that older adults, uh, unlike younger people, are less likely to say, you know, I'm really thinking about suicide. Uh, what he said is that I don't know why I'm living. I have nothing to live for. I'm in too much pain. It would be best for everyone if I wasn't here. And so, again, he's not saying I'm going to kill myself tomorrow, um, but he's really setting a stage for his desire to die. And uh, this type of thing, the reason I show this in this case example, is that this is really very typical, uh, what we hear from older men, older women, and, uh, you know, and uh, these middle-aged men that, uh, and women that use the line as well, um, which is, it would be best for everyone if I wasn't here. You know, it's really a justification uh, for you know, uh, my death, that I'm doing this, uh, and it's a really good reason my son won't have to worry about me anymore. You know, I'm, I'm kind of taking care of people uh, because I don't feel like I belong. Um, I will share a suicide note, um, the, some suicide notes with you as well, because I think it is useful for us uh, to hear, you know, from older people themselves, even those who have died, and I'll, I'll set a context for that in a few moments. Um, so we know that suicide risk has been increasing, particularly in middle-aged men, uh, as well as uh, older men as well. And when we think about assessment, uh, what we're wanting to do is not so much to predict if this individual is going to take their own life. Um, because, um, you know, what I've learned from some of the leaders in the field of suicidology is that it's really very uh, difficult to not possible uh, to be able to know when somebody might take their own life uh, unless that person happened to be someone who died right in front of you. Uh, that it's, and, and many of our grievers, the other aspect of uh, our friendship line, we're called the Center for Elderly Suicide Prevention and Grief-Related Services. As I said, friendship line is one of the pillars of our uh, services. Uh, the others, uh, other is uh, our grief services, which are traumatic loss uh, grief services, either individual or group. And oftentimes we'll have people in our traumatic loss grief group uh, who one woman, uh, an older woman had uh, come home and she had her grandchildren with her and they walked into the living room, uh, you know, from coming from outdoors and her husband was standing there and she said, I had no idea that he had a gun in his hand. I couldn't even, I couldn't even put that in my mind. And, uh, and he shot and killed himself um, as she walked into the living room with her uh, grandchildren. And, uh, you know, so, you know, she didn't know that he was uh, suicidal either. Uh, but it's something that, that we have to really, uh, you know, be thoughtful about, is that we don't know when somebody might indeed take their own life, uh, but there are some cues, and that's really what we're gonna be talking about. But it is a difficult uh, topic, you know, and I know that. Uh, 
And I also wanted to say that, you know, with a, a group this size, that I'm sure that some of you have had the experience of uh, uh, losing someone to uh, death by suicide. Uh, it, it might have been maybe a colleague or a family member or a uh, neighbor or someone like that. Um, and, and you know that suicide bereavement is quite complex and uh, difficult. And so um, I just want to empathize with you because I know this type of death is very difficult. And, and we don't know to look at us, you know, who is a survivor of a loved one who died by suicide. Uh, there's no big S on our, S on our uh, foreheads, uh, survivor. Um, and so I just want us to be thoughtful about that because I think, uh, again, there will be people in this room that have uh, uh, these kinds of losses. And, um, you know, so you might feel yourself having some emotion around this as well. And I just wanted to acknowledge that. You know, but what we're trying to do with people is to place them on a continuum. Uh, that uh, of suicidality, meaning that there's no uh, likelihood of uh, suicide uh, to a high likelihood of suicide. And, and what we often talk about are risk factors, uh, but I also think it's very important to talk about protective factors. Those protective factors don't get as much attention. And, and one of them that I mentioned already is connection. You know, um, connections are what bind us to life. And, and so um, I really see that over my 43 years in this career is uh, that, that connections with really lonely people, you know, once you develop some rapport, uh, can really make all the difference uh, between uh, a, a life that has some quality in it uh, or a life where somebody is really thinking about uh, ending it, as the example from that gentleman uh, said. Uh, that I think people would be better off without me. Um, so we want to be aware of that. Um, some other assessment issues that when you think about, and some of you probably do these things already, uh, what I, I, I really appreciate about uh, being invited to speak to people is that what I'm hoping to do is validate you know, what many of you may know. Uh, I, I hope that we might come up with some you know, different perspectives or different ways of looking at this. Uh, for people. Uh, I hope that the talk energizes you, uh, that makes you uh, be more thoughtful uh, about, you know, uh, working with depressed people or uh, uh, suicidal people or people that are abusing substances. And, uh, and, and uh, but I want to, to always keep at least, you know, some perspective on protective issues. Uh, and one of them being making connections. Um, so what we want to do is uh, ask directly about suicidal thoughts. You know, I know for some people asking a 80-year-old person if they're thinking about suicide feels kind of odd uh, if you're not uh, trained in the field of aging. And, uh, but it's something that we have to do. But it's an essential part of history taking, meaning that I remind people all the time that an 80-year-old person didn't come out of the womb at 79. Uh, you know, they were a little baby. and you know, uh, toddler, and, uh, and that what we want to pay attention to and we want to ask them is to have they thought about suicide at any point in their lives? What we, we know, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, the ratio of attempts to completed acts of suicide, for example, among young people, 15 to 24 years of age, for example, is something like 100 to 200 attempts to one death by suicide. Uh, so what we know is that there are a lot of people, and maybe people in this room, who just felt really, really awful at some point maybe as a teenager and uh, thought if I took these aspirin and had five beers that I would die. You know, they didn't, they got sick or they felt horrible. Uh, and they might not have done anything. You know, they didn't go to a hospital, they didn't tell their parents, they might have told some of their pals. Uh, but then they just kind of moved on. Um, but that's a, a concern, and um, you know, we'll talk about Dr. Thomas Joyner and his interpersonal theory of suicide, uh, because he would say that's important information to have, even if the person downplays it. Because what we know about these teenagers is that their intention is to die, although fortunately uh, they didn't choose a highly lethal means to do it, so they survived. 
Uh, this is particularly true of people born between 1946 and 1964 that we call the baby boomers. Uh, and uh, that many of them, myself included, uh, had attempted suicide uh, because of just circumstances being so out of control and, uh, and survived and didn't tell anybody. You know, I know that for myself and I'm very grateful that I survived, but I understand that kind of you know, secrecy that often comes with suicide attempts with teenagers. Uh, they just don't talk about it. And, uh, and yet, you know, uh, down the road, uh, what might happen is that the rigors of aging uh, might provoke some of those feelings of lack of control or powerlessness that they might have felt when they were teenagers. And so they already had that thought, you know, uh, the, of taking their own life. And so that's important in history taking to be able to uh, talk about it. What I've seen in my work when I talk to people in their 70s, 80s, uh, 90s about uh, prior suicide attempts, uh, that they'll often say, no, I never did. But I don't necessarily believe them. Uh, and then I'll keep going back to that until I feel reassured that they hadn't ever really considered suicide. But what you'll be surprised is how many have or how many uh, uh, older adults have had some trauma, uh, either a secondary trauma uh, where they observed uh, maybe abuse of their parent, their mother, uh, or they were abused themselves. And those kinds of traumas that were never dealt with. It's different if somebody had been helped or talked to or somebody provided support and they were able to work through some of that trauma. But it amazes me how many older people just kept going, you know, um, and whether it was sexual abuse or physical abuse or both, uh, or witnessing the abuse of others, uh, which can be very terrifying for uh, 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 young people and uh, can also uh, pop back up when we encounter other stressful times in our uh, lives. Um, so we want to, you know, explore, explore whether the person feels anxious or agitated. We want to explore depression. You know, we know uh, in terms of the, the suicide research that depression is one of the key risk factors when it comes to um, older adults. But it's always tied, when you're reading the literature, you see the same sentence over and over again, which is depression among the elderly is unrecognized and untreated most often. Uh, and so one of the, the issues that I try to raise with people is, I think we use the term depression too willy-nilly. We just toss it out. If you have a, uh, don't have anything to do over the weekend, you might be saying to you, others, oh, I had a depressing weekend. No, you didn't. It wasn't a depressing weekend. You know, you're not clinically depressed because you didn't have somewhere to go Saturday night. What you might have had was a disappointing weekend. You know, um, that's a different kind of, of story. Um, and I see this on some of the committees I'm on nationally, is that there's a, you know, a movement, and you see this in some of the current literature, is that we want to get back to basics about depression being a clinical description of uh, somebody's state of mind, a mental health issue. Uh, but we do, we just toss it around and we're depressed about everything, you know? Um, and so it, it kind of loses, you know, its meaning when we just throw it around. And then people say aging is depressing. Uh, well, aging is many things, but it doesn't necessarily have to be depressing. Uh, you know, depression isn't a normal part of aging. Uh, so we have to be very thoughtful uh, about that and remind ourselves that I'm really thinking about clinical depression. I'm not talking about somebody that is demoralized. You know, I would rather have somebody say to me, my, my staff say, I'm talking to somebody that is uh, experiencing demoralization or disappointment uh, and to reserve you know, uh, uh, an assessment of depression for somebody that, that may actually be depressed. And we'll talk about that as we go along. Um, but I think it is important. The other thing has to do with, you know, um, alcoholic beverages, uh, substance abuse. Uh, there was an article in the uh, Journal of Internal Medicine by Dr. Grace uh, Chang, and in it she was talking about the hidden epidemic of alcohol uh, abuse among older adults. 
And that just reminded me of Dr. Frederick Blow, who was the creator of the Michigan Alcohol Screening Test geriatric version. Uh, and uh, Dr. Blow had said back in the 90s, uh, you know, that substance abuse was a hidden epidemic uh, among older people. And now Dr. Chang is saying the same thing. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's getting to be pretty clear, and others are also commenting on the same thing, that we need to pay attention uh, to people that are misusing alcohol, but also uh, uh, prescription drugs and also illicit drugs. You know, uh, when I give the talks in rural, Calif uh, rural California, particularly in Humboldt County, if you're familiar with Humboldt County, and I even begin to talk about illicit drugs, they all just start laughing uh, because it's just so common. Uh, but what we have to think about is not just, you know, uh, the use of marijuana. Uh, and I know, you know, many people have, you know, medical marijuana, you know, uh, for medicine uh, to use that. Um, but I know, and you know this too, there are many people that have those cards in California uh, who are in their 60s and 70s, uh, but it really is the 1960s all over again, except they feel like it's legal this time. Uh, but what worries me uh, is that some uh, people that use medical marijuana are depressed, you know, uh, or they're being treated for depression. And there's been uh, uh, numerous work, Dr. Satra, S-A-T-R-E, I don't think he's on your uh, reference list, but Dr. Uh, Derek Satra um, has done studies looking at older people who are being treated for depression who are continuing to use marijuana. And that what his studies indicate is that the marijuana interferes with the treatment. Uh, and so they're not, the, the antidepressant isn't really doing its job in terms of uh, reducing uh, the symptoms of depression. And what he's talking about is that the marijuana use in combination with the antidepressant uh, is causing some changes in the way the antidepressant works. So I think it's just something, again, to uh, think about. Uh, and or the use of heroin or methamphetamine, uh, you know, these are questions that we usually didn't ask very much. You know, uh, you know when I started off in the field of aging, I never asked those questions. Uh, to even ask about alcohol was kind of, you know, uh, uh, intense, you know, for a lot of older adults. And, uh, you know, and so we didn't ask those questions, but certainly, as the uh, aging baby boomers are pushing into their 70s, uh, you know, the literature is pretty clear that baby boomers are taking their drugs of choice along with them. And uh, so we need to be able to ask that. And I think that if we feel uncomfortable with that, you know, that's why I think it's always good to talk to one's supervisors or talk to your colleagues about, you know, that counter-transference. What, what is preventing me to, uh, from asking those questions? You know, and my, my experience has been if somebody doesn't use those, they just say, I've never used that or I'm not interested or I did in the 1960s or 70s or something, uh, but it's not something I use anymore. Uh, but I do think it's better to ask that question uh, than to make an assumption uh, that they don't uh, uh, use those uh, drugs. Um, you know, uh, current alcohol use, uh, you know, and I, 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 when I ask people about alcohol use, I ask about a standard drink, uh, you know, if you drink alcohol, you know, do you drink a, like a standard glass of wine or a standard beer? And, and I tell you that most of my uh, clients um, have no idea what I'm talking about. You know, so uh, they'll say, and, and then I say, could you show me the glass in which you have the wine? Well, now that's very different than them saying, I have a glass of wine maybe every day. Then they show me this goblet in which they have the wine. And they're technically correct, they're only having one glass of wine, but it might be equivalent to two or three. Uh, you know, you've seen those, those wine glasses. You know, they hold much more than five ounces, which would be a standard uh, glass. Uh, or what I find from men more, more often is that they'll say, I just have a couple cans of beers a day. And then I say, is it a 40-ouncer or a 12-ouncer? Well, it often is a 40 ouncer, so what they're having is 80 uh, or 120 ounces of beer rather than 12 ounces. You know, so uh, it's important to, you know, when you get into those questions is that I, I think it's always good to say, you know, can I see the glass in which you have that one drink? Uh, it's very uh, helpful.
uh, sometimes people refuse, which is an answer in and of itself. Uh, and that kind of tells you a little something. Uh, and then lethal means, uh, especially firearms. Um, an example is I do these uh, crisis intervention team training for law enforcement. And at the most recent one that I was at, the um, sergeant uh, who was facilitating had said to the uh, uh, participants that uh, he was supervising these two police officers and they were called out on a well-being check. And neighbors were concerned about this older woman who lived uh, near them. It was out in rural um, uh, Yolo County. And uh, they just said that they thought she was acting kind of erratically. And so these two police officers went out and saw her. And they were there for about 10 minutes. And uh, they uh, radioed back to the sergeant and said, uh, you know, she seemed agitated. Uh, but we talked to her for a few minutes. And she calmed down. And she said things were fine. And, uh, and they left. Uh, but the sergeant wasn't satisfied with their comments and was a little worried about this situation. So he went out to see her um, and got there maybe 45 minutes later. And um, when he was chatting with her at the door, um, you know, she did seem agitated. And then he said, you know, he said, uh, you know, I'm really thirsty. Do you have any water or iced tea or something? You know, it was a hot day. And she said, oh, yeah, come on in, which is very typical of a lot of older people. They're very welcoming. And again, as we saw with the friendship line, people, older people are more comfortable with a conversation than a confrontation. And he understood that. So she invited him in, and he was sitting there in the, the kitchen having a glass of iced tea or something. And he noticed a lot of photographs. And he said, oh, who's the older gentleman that you're beside? Is that your husband? And she said, yes. And he said, um, Oh, is, is, you know, is he still here? Is you know, he, he all right? And she said, oh, he's in the back bedroom. And he's not all right. He's very sick. And so he asked some questions about the husband. And, uh, and she was saying that she was worried about him and this and that. And he said, well, you know, how sick is he? Or what, what do you think is going to happen? And she said, well, it's all going to come to an end tonight because I'm going to shoot him. And then I'm going to kill myself. Uh, we made this arrangement that if I was sick, he would do this to me. And if he were sick, I'm to do this with him. And tonight's the night. And he said he was so taken aback by her just casualness about it. So he said, well, I'm assuming you have a firearm. And she said, oh, yeah, I've got a lot of firearms. And so he said, oh, could I see them? And there were eight firearms that she had. All eight were loaded. And none of the safeties were on. And uh, so he said, you know, is this something that you really want to do? And she said, uh, hesitated, and she said, well, I'm going to have to do it because I agreed. And he said, well, we're going to have a change of course, you know. Uh, and then he saw the husband who was really sick and uh, really dehydrated because she had vision problems, she had her own health problems, and so he wasn't eating properly. So. Uh, he told her, he said he's going to call, you know, for an ambulance and then he's going to take her into, um, you know, to see somebody in terms of her mental health. And, uh, and she readily agreed. Uh, and he said you could see her relief uh, that something, you know, which might have been a really tragic situation, uh, was averted. And, and, um, and when he talked to his two police officers that went out, they were really shocked uh, that this was going on. And he said, you know, that's the difference between working with younger people, uh, even people in their 50s versus somebody in their late 70s, is that, you know, you can gain more information um, if you say things like, you know, can I have a glass of water or just have a conversation uh, rather than just being so technical. Uh, and so um, that situation got resolved. The husband, unfortunately, died on his own uh, because he had been very sick. and. Um, uh, was in the hospital hospital for about a week, and uh, she's doing much better. In fact, Friendship Line talks to her. That's, uh, so it's a, it's a better situation uh, overall, uh, but very difficult. And so those are the kinds of things that we want to be aware of, uh, particularly in terms of uh, the use of firearms, and uh, and to always ask about that. Uh, but one has to also take care of yourself because if somebody has Parkinson's or tremors of any kind. And they say, oh, yeah, here's the gun. One, one older man had opened his uh, coffee table drawer when I had asked about lethal weapons. 
and pulled out, and he held the gun, which was also loaded and no safety on. And I said, oh, please put that back down, um, because I wasn't quite, uh, I was not prepared for him just to pull out the gun right then. Uh, but, you know, it's just something to be uh, aware of. And, and then, you know, is there any recent stress? You know, uh, is something going on? Uh, has there been any prior uh, family history of suicide or violent behavior? So you're wanting to investigate about trauma. Uh, and, uh, and, you, and you also want to start thinking this framework of, you know, has this person ever had a prior suicide attempt? Have they ever thought about suicide as a way to escape from a difficult situation? So you want to gather some background information. Is in the region or county, is there um, good access for treatment? You know, if indeed this person does indicate that, you know, they're um, very intent on killing themselves, you know, do we know where I can easily uh, call or, or take the person uh, so that they would receive treatment? What I've learned over the years um, is that when people say, oh, there's this facility or that facility, I ask them, have they ever been there? And have you seen how older people are treated? Which is often very different uh, than young people being treated. An example was, uh, you know, I said I'm from a rural area in Pennsylvania, and uh, a number of years ago, my dad had a stroke, and my dad is an alcoholic, and um, he was at, at the time um, in his middle 80s. And my brother, my youngest brother, um, you know, he was taken to the emergency room in an ambulance, and my younger brother uh, got there. And um, as they were evaluating my dad, he heard the um, attending physician get on the phone uh, to call to see if they had a bed that my dad could go to. And the physician said, uh, I'm here with an old drunk, and um, we need to get a bed. And my brother was standing right there. And he turned to the physician when the physician hung up, and he said, that old drunk is my dad. And, uh, and I'm really shocked at how you referred to him. And he said, well, you know, he said, we're really busy, and he's a drunk, and yeah, I know I should have used better language, but we're in a hurry. And my brother said, well, I'm not in a hurry, and I'm really <laughs> upset about you know, how you referred to him. And, uh, and then my dad, uh, unfortunately, died uh, uh, you know, a couple days after that. Uh, but, but I think it's very different when we're in there ourselves uh, versus if I'm an older person there alone and uh, I have alcohol issues or whatever issues that I might have, how people are treated. So I think it's always useful if you don't know the facility, go to it. And, and spend a little time to see how people are you know, treated, particularly older adults. Um, and uh, so we want to be aware of that loneliness. Of course, uh, you know, do they have chronic pain? And has there been a recent hospitalization? For a lot of older people, that's very traumatic. Have they been to an emergency room recently? Uh, that might be very traumatic for them. Uh, they might be very unhappy about going back into a hospital setting, uh, fearing that they won't come out of it. Uh, and uh, have they had, are there are features of dementia? Uh, have they had a stroke, that kind of thing? So those are areas that we want to be uh, thoughtful about. So uh, just in terms of the scope of the problem with suicide uh, in the elderly, you know, for example, in 2014, according to the official data from the American Association of Suicidology, the rate of suicide for the nation, for the general population, was 13.4 per 100,000 population. Uh, the rate for young people uh, was 11.6 per 100,000 population. And young is usually looked at 15 to 24 years of age, although people younger have uh, taken their lives. Um, the suicide rate for older people is 16.6 per 100,000, and that's for people uh, 65 plus. Uh, suicide has returned back to the um, uh, top 10 leading causes of death, where for a number of years, I think starting in 1979, it started to, uh, the rate of suicide started to decline and it dropped out of the uh, top 10 leading causes of death, but it has now returned. Um, and uh, what do you think changed? Why have suicide rates uh, bumped up? Uh, particularly for middle-aged men. What do you think occurred uh, that caused a shift? 
the, yeah, the uh, economy, you know, which we, we usually say uh, the recession started in 2007, uh, but when you ask people, it starts a little bit before, uh, that things weren't so good for people for a while. And uh, so the financial stress, uh, particularly on, on middle-aged men, uh, that some of you might know people like this who uh, may have been uh, just like the gentleman 63 who I talked about earlier, uh, but even people in their 50s, if you've worked somewhere for 20 years and you think this is going to be my career job, I'm going to be here and I'm going to retire here, and you get laid off at the age of 53 or 55 or 56, uh, trying to find a comparable job at the comparable pay uh, often isn't available. Uh, and depending upon the region uh, in which one lives, uh, there might not be jobs in that particular industry. I've known people in the state of uh, Oregon, you know, who are out of jobs, very talented, smart people, uh, were out of jobs for a couple years um, because they couldn't find a comparable job at a comparable rate of pay. Uh, and uh, so that can be very demoralizing for people. And then demoralization can easily start moving into depression. Uh, if you feel the burden uh, of the, you know, the need to, to take care of your family if you have children, uh, this can be very uh, 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 difficult. You know, and when people say to me, well, I think ageism is kind of easing up, no, uh, I don't experience that the same way. I think particularly in employment, uh, you know, that it's, it's not uh, easy to be middle-aged uh, in your job and then to lose the job and, and try to get back to that same level of pay that you had before uh, just might not happen. There was a gentleman in California who had a master's degree in some kind of um, technical skills. Uh, and in Silicon Valley, at 40, you're a brontosaurus um, you know, in those tech companies, and he was in his 50s. And he could not get a job. And he said, finally, this person that he was working with at an uh, employment agency said, well, you could probably be a manager at maybe a McDonald's or something like that. And, uh, and he, just, he just, not that that's a bad job, uh, but he just felt that that was such a slap in the face for him uh, with his background and training. And uh, you know, he had a lot of uh, uh, problems as a result of that. So, um, Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death. Uh, homicide is the 17th leading cause of death, um, according to the American Association of Suicidology. So, um, you know, we want to really think about uh, uh, people that could be at risk of suicide and, uh, and can we intervene? Uh, but again, it really requires us being available and also recognizing uh, uh, both risk factors as well as protective factors. And so uh, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention um, had uh, you know, a lot of information about the various states uh, and uh, you know, suicide uh, facts and figures. You might have seen these. Suicide is the eighth leading cause of death overall in Oregon. And uh, you can look at those in a little bit more uh, detail. Uh, but I'm really concerned about suicide death in rural counties, uh, whether it's here in Oregon or California or wherever. And um, uh, Dr. Julie Goldstein uh, Grummet uh, from the Suicide Prevention Resource Center in Washington has stated that suicide rates tend to be high in rural areas in part because there is greater access to firearms, high rates of drug and alcohol use, and few healthcare providers and emergency medical facilities. Uh, it's a lethal triad. And so that's why I think it's really important when we're doing assessments is that we really have to think about, you know, access to lethality or lethal methods, you know, uh, drugs and alcohol, and also accessibility of some kind of care. Um, and, and I think it's quite uh, troubling uh, when I go to rural counties and I, I learn that there aren't a lot of, you know, uh, some counties, particularly in Northern California, which I know much better, is that um, there might be a social worker in a county that has maybe 30,000 people, but is a big county. And she was trained in you know, uh, mental health, but not aging and mental health. But she is you know, kind of, she has to see these older people, uh, but she doesn't have a background at all in the field of aging. 
and, and that makes it very difficult for her to connect uh, with older people. Uh, one social worker that I met in, um, I think it was Plumas County, beautiful county, but land sakes, there's not much there in terms of you know, uh, facilities for people. And, uh, and she said, you know, I do this, and she said, quite frankly, Patrick, I don't like older people. Uh, the reason I like mental health is because I work with adolescents and young adults. And she said, if I wanted to work with older people, I would have studied gerontology, uh, but I don't. Uh, so I have to do this. Uh, but she said, I don't like it. Uh, and, and I understand that she's just one of a gazillion people in this country who don't want to be old, you know, uh, and who see old age as the worst thing that can happen to a person. Um, I really appreciated her honesty, you know, uh, that she was able to put that out there. And she said, and, and I, I agree with her. I mean, I'm sure technically she does as good a job as she possibly can. But the thing that I believe a lot of older people need is warmth, you know, um, empathy, you know, uh, connection, somebody that isn't afraid of them. Uh, and so um, I really feel for a lot of people that are kind of shoved into uh, working with older people when that isn't necessarily the population that they really were trained to work with or were interested in working with. Uh, they just wound up in that. Uh, and, and I think it's particularly uh, challenging in rural counties uh, you know, to really easily uh, connect with people. Um, in 2014, according to the American Foundation of uh, Suicide, uh, in Oregon, the highest suicide rate, which is almost 20 per 100,000, uh, was uh, for uh, people 85 years of age and older. So the old, old population, uh, you know, and this is true with counties across the country, uh, you know, have a very high rate of suicide. And, and what's, what's alarming to me, you know, and, and sometimes I think people think, well, they're 85. You know, they've lived a good life. People always throw in this descriptor, they had a good life, or maybe they had a horrible life. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and so we, we don't mm, take it as seriously a as I think that we might. Um, and, and when we know that the 85 plus age category is the fastest growing category in America, age category in America, and the second fastest age growing category is the 100 plus. So that somebody 85 uh, might be able to live for another 10, 15 years. Uh, and for most of us in this room, I would think probably all of us, the statistically anyway, the likelihood of us living well into our 80s, possibly into our 90s, uh, and maybe into our 100s, uh, you know, statistically is probably going to happen. Uh, and when I say this to you, do you say to yourself, yippee, you know? <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. I'm going to be alive for another, whatever, 40 years, depending upon what your age is. Uh, and and I, I don't think that that's the case. I think that we're in a lot of denial about this, or we think that other people might live to be that age. But I think that there is a sense that, you know, we're, we're probably not going to live that long. Uh, but people are. Um, but to, to, to me, to have somebody who is in their 80s, uh, 90s, you know, uh, using this time of their life to contemplate suicide, um, and, and they don't have a terminal illness, uh, that, that it really uh, is heartbreaking um, when, you, when you think about it. Um, also, just for a moment, I'd like you to um, think about your chronological age. Might be different than the age you tell people you are, uh, so you don't have to reveal it but I just want you to say your age to yourself and just be aware of what comes up inside of you when you say it. So for example, I'm 68, I'll be 69 in December, and as I said to the group the other day, the first thought that comes through my mind is, yikes. I'm like surprised, it always surprises me. Uh, you know, even though I know my age, but when I say it, it's like, oh my God, uh, time has passed. Um, and uh, so I invite you just to pay attention to that counter-transference. You know, one of the important things about uh, having a little time with people is to be able to think not just about people out here, uh, but yourself, you know, and how you feel about your own aging and how you feel about the aging of your parents or grandparents, if you still have them. You know, uh, you know one of the things in the aging literature that uh, is often uh, brought up is that 
you know, uh, I think it's Susan Jacoby in her book, Never Say Die, uh, the myths and realities around the marketing of the new old age. Uh, I, I don't know, has anybody read that book? And uh, what did you think of that book? And isn't it difficult, though? Oh, my God. It's one of those books that, that I love it, but I hate it. You know? Because she does it means works. You know? She just tells it as it is. But it's so good. Uh, and what she says is that we hold as the standard for aging. For example, this 92-year-old woman who's very healthy, maybe still working out there golfing, exercising. Uh, and, and we say, oh, that's the standard. And so most of the reality, and she's really good about the reality. I think she talks about her own mother in that. And she said, my mother has a lot of health issues and she's very unhappy. Uh, and, uh, but that's the standard that we kind of put up there. Uh, and then most of us fail at that because we're not going to be out there golfing and happy and healthy and all that.